identify blue badger dead both from um, its chemistry, um, so differentiating it from other blue pigments, and morphologically differentiating it from natural azurite. Um, and this time period being the earliest that blue verditor was made successfully fits in with the earliest records for the method um, for manufacturing blue verditor. Um, and it was commented on, for example, by Christopher Merritt um, and Robert Boyle also commented on the process. Um, and it was as a product of the silver refining industry. Um, so chalk, whiting, um, was added to copper nitrate solution, copper water, um, and they were mixed together until the copper nitrate solution had turned colourless. Um, then the solid product was filtered off, um, and so then you'd add fresh reactants and repeat the process until you had the blue pigment. Um, however, um, the early commentators um, also talked about how it was quite a problematic method. Um, so Merritt writes, it is a strange and great mystery to see how small and undiscernible a nicety, though the same materials be used, makes the one and the other colour, as is daily discovered by the resiners in making their vertices who sometimes with the same materials and quantities of them for that aquafortis, nitric acid, and with the same copper plates and whiting make a very fair blue verditor, otherwise a fairer or more dirty green, whereof they can assign no reason, nor can they hit on a certain rule to make constantly their verditor of a fair blue, to their great disprofit, the blue being of manifold greater value than the green. Um, and so the most significant study into this method um, was by Mech Taggart et al. in 1980, um, and their research has been very influential on the subsequent literature. Um, they describe how they successfully make blue verdita, but only under specific reaction conditions. Um, so you need it to, it to be less than 12 degrees um, with intermittent stirring and specific reactant concentrations. They found, as Merritt wrote, that repeated washes improved the color of the product. However, they only use cross polar microscopy to identify the product. Um, so it's hard to say conclusively that it was synthetic azurite and not another related blue compound. Um, they also don't give any reasoning for their results. They don't say why these conditions are necessary to make the pigment, nor do they characterize the unsuccessful green project. So therefore, the aims of this project were to reproduce um, the McTaggart results and confirm whether this refiner's verditor method makes synthetic azurite, as well as investigating the color change from green to blue, and to do this using Raman spectroscopy, powder x-ray diffraction, and scanning electron microscopy, which weren't available in the McTaggart report, as well as cross-polar microscopy to compare to it. And finally, to investigate and account for the reaction conditions needed. Um, so firstly, yeah, investigating um, the method that the conditions that they describe as being necessary to make blue verdita. Um, so after some trials, um, we managed to make um, it work and get the blue pigment. Um, and so it reacted as the McTaggart described. Um, and so we added the copper nitrate solution and chalk, um, stirred intermittently, filtered, and that gave the MAC1 product. We then added the MAC1 product back in with um, more reactants, did it again, and that gave MAC2, and repeated a third time, and that gave MAC3. Um, and as you can see, we got a color change from a greenish blue pigment to a rich blue pigment. Um, so the questions remained, is this synthetic azurite, and why does the color change? Um, and so we found that MAC3 does contain synthetic azurite, but it also contains ruite. Um, and ruite is the mineral name for a copper hydroxy nitrate, which is green in color. Um, and so you can see from the PXRD spectra that MAC3 at the bottom in black contains peaks, both co corresponding to ruite, such as the first starred peak, and azurite, such as the second starred peak. Um, and in the Raman spectra, you can see that on the scale of the spot size, the spectra for MAC1, MAC2, and MAC3 have peaks corresponding to both azurite and ruite. Um, and so we tried to extract, I tried to extract information from the Raman spectra about the relative amounts of azurite and ruite in each sample by taking many readings across the sample spatially. But due to peak convolution, um, we didn't really get any useful results. However, since I left, Ellen's done further um, work on powder X-ray diffraction um, of the MAC1, MAC2 and MAC3 samples. Um, and she's found that as you go from MAC1 to MAC3, the proportion of ruite decreases and the proportion of azurite increases. And so that's why we get this color change from a greenish blue to a richer blue. 
Um, and so therefore it can be assumed that the copper nitrate solution reacts to make copper hydroxide, which is um, we see as a, a grayish precipitate. This forms rheolite and then finally azurite forms. And then so we then compared um, to the McTaggart results using cross polar microscopy. Um, and so we saw cauliflower like aggregates that they described. Um, and we also saw um, black crosses appearing, um, which you can just about see in this picture under cross polars. So those were the descriptions they gave the pigment. And so as far as we can tell, um, we made the same projects that they did. Um, furthermore, the SEM images were quite interesting. So these are two images of the MAC3 product, um, and you can see two distinctive morphologies. Um, so firstly, circles in blue, um, intersecting flat plates, forming a nodular structure, and um, circles in green, much larger flat plates. And so now if I show um, a picture of pure ruite, you can see that the flat plates are the ruite, and so the other morphology must be azurite. So we had successfully made blue verdita, and um, we showed that it contains azurite, and also a ruite byproduct, which causes the greenish colour. Um, and so we, now we've done this, and we tried to alter the reaction conditions to see how this change the product formed. Um, so this first line summarises what I've just described. Under cold conditions, intermittent stirring and normal concentration, we made azurite and ruite. Um, firstly, we increased the temperature to um, more like 18, 19 degrees, the room temperature in the lab. Um, and this gave the exact same results, um, which is interesting as it directly contradicts um, the conclusion in the McTaggart paper that cold temperatures were necessary. Um, and it's also significant because there's been further speculation um, on, based on the paper saying maybe the English could make blue verdita and not the French due to colder winter temperatures in England. Mm -hmm. um, so this was quite significant um, to show it could still be done at elevated temperatures. Um, however, at much higher temperatures, so between 45 and 65 degrees, only rewrite formed. Then altering the concentration, so uh, a quarter of the concentration of copper nitrate solution, um, to begin with, there wasn't much reaction, but then we found that malachite formed. So malachite is um, a related um, basic copper carbonate, um, which is um, got a different stoichiometry, um, and it's also green. So it's a different green product that formed. Um, then finally, altering the stirring. Um, so when we didn't stir the reaction at all, to begin with, we only got ruite, but then after quite a long period, we got some azurite and malachite nucleating. Um, and from this image of the flask, you can see a distinct blue layer at the, the bottom of the flask, um, which is where um, the azurite, the pure azurite is forming. So it was in quite a heterogeneous way. Um, then fine, and also altering stirring with constant stirring, only ruite formed again. Um, and finally, um, since I left, Ellen's done an experiment where she imposed an artificial um, carbon dioxide atmosphere, um, and that seems to have made quite pure azurite. Um, so she needs to do some further studies, but hasn't found any evidence yet of rewrite and malachite there. So as you can see, it's quite a complex system. By altering the conditions, we get a large variety of different products, um, and this diversity can be seen um, in the SEM images. Um, so those samples that contain azurite have this um, interlocking plate structure. Um, those that contain ruite have large flat plates. Um, and there's a third morphology, um, which kind of looks fluffy. <laughs> um, it's either calcium carbonate or malachite, um, but we need to do some EDX on the samples to determine that. Um, so we have a lot of empirical data for the effect of other conditions on the product formed. Um, and we started one on, and Ellen's done a lot of work on explanations for these. Um, there's a lot more work to do, but I'll go through a couple of the general ideas that we have for why we're getting this variation. So, for, and so discussing the results. Um, so firstly, um, considering the effect of carbon dioxide. Um, so we saw that a carbon dioxide atmosphere favors azurite. Um, and this can be explained just using Le Chatelier. So um, if you have carbon dioxide dissolved, it makes carbonate ions, and those are what need to react with the ruite to form azurite. So you can assume that if you have an increase in CO2 partial pressure, 
that's going to favour the formation of azurite. Um, this could have some consequences for the manufacturing method. Um, so one question outstanding is whether artificial carbon dioxide atmospheres could be created in the early modern period. If they could, and some of the manufacturers started to understand that um, carbon dioxide um, has an effect on the reaction, it could be that some of the manufacturers were making purer product. However, however if they didn't manage to do this, um, it could explain why they were seeing quite a lot of variation in the products. Um, a room with the doors and windows shut and a fire will have quite a different carbon dioxide partial pressure to open windows. So that could explain their variation they were seeing. Um, furthermore, if they were making imp impure blue verditor products with some traces of ruite, it could mean that ruite can be used as a diagnostic for if we find blue verditor pigments and paintings. Um, if we find traces of ruite there, as it's so rarely occurring naturally, it could be because this was the method used to make that blue verditor. Um, the temperature dependence seems to be um, related to the carbon dioxide um, dependence, but it's not fully understood um, and a lot more research needs to be done into the complexities of the temperature dependence. Um, and secondly, the effect of stirring. Um, it seems that constant stirring disrupts crystal growth. Um, so it stops the azurite crystals from growing. Um, but that if you don't stir it enough, um, there isn't a, enough contact between the ruite and the fresh solution, um, which could be preventing um, azurite from forming if it's um, diffusion limited. Um, but we don't really understand why malachite is also found without stirring. So to summarize, um, we found that the McTaggart method successfully makes synthetic azurite, but that the color variation is due to varying proportions of azurite, malachite, and ruite. Um, we found that the reaction is successful at room temperature, contrary to the McTaggart report, but that changes in temperature, concentration, and stirring favor other products. And so further research is needed into the reaction mechanism, which can have historical consequences. Um, we're only, we were only starting to discover how complex the system this is. Um, and so hopefully Ella's further work will bring some clarity to that. Um, but thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you very much, Sarah. That's, that's extremely clear, extremely straightforward. Yeah, it almost looks so simple. It probably is lots of uh, late evenings in the lab behind all this experimentation and, and trying again and again. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, we'll go on to our next speaker, uh, Celia Chari. Uh, she's just uh, recently moved from California Institute of Technology uh, to a postdoc position in uh, Boston. Is that uh, Harvard? Arts, uh, yeah, it's center, the, it? can you hear me okay? It's the Strath Center for Conservation and Technical Studies in Harvard. Oh, really exciting! That's well, okay. It'd be lovely to hear uh, to 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 hear more about your 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 project. Uh, that that's a PhD uh, project. For, yes. okay. All right, great. Over to you. Okay, so hello, uh, my name is Celia Chari, and today I'll be talking about the mystery behind two famous purple colorants from the 18th century Meissen manufactory. So I, I had the pleasure of working on this project during my PhD in material science at the California Institute of Technology, uh, where I recently just defended, and as Antonis mentioned, I'm now um, at the Stroud Center at Harvard. But the Meissen uh, Luster project that I'm going to be talking about today uh, was years in the making originating at Northwestern through a collaboration with the Art Institute of Chicago, and finally ending at Caltech several years later through some successful purple luster recreations that I helped carry out uh, in the lab of Professor Catherine Faber. So to start off, I wanted to talk about the origins of the Meissen Manufactory, founded by Augusto II the Strong, uh, shown here, uh, can you see my uh, mouse okay? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, so Augustus was uh, strong in the early 18th century. He was a passionate collector of porcelain, which up until that point was solely procured from the Far East. Its recipe comprising of kaolin clay and finely ground china stone fired at approximately 1400 degrees Celsius was closely guarded for centuries. 
And the microstructure that was produced from this uh, high temperature firing step can be seen here where we can really think of porcelain as a composite made of a glassy silicate matrix with aluminosilicate particles embedded within it. So here we have an example of a large uh, quartz crystal and also we can see little acicular molite crystals that come from the high temperature decomposition of uh, kaolin. So Augustus the Strong supported experimental research by Schoenhaus, uh, who was an alchemist that explored the melting temperature of different materials, and also Johann Friedrich Bottger, an alchemist uh, who um, earlier tried to transform mercury into gold. Um, and together, Schoenhaus and Bottger's uh, high temperature experiments uh, allowed them to develop the first uh, recipe or the recipe for the first European hard paste porcelain to the delight of Augustus the Strong, which ultimately led to the creation of the Meissen Manufactory. So the earliest porcelain bodies from Meissen, which are referred to as Butker porcelain, combined powdered alabaster, uh, which is a type of gypsum, with Schnorr's earth. So in addition to kaolinite, uh, Schnorr's earth was associated with some quartz and feldspar, which served as temper and as flux, respectively, in this porcelain paste. And this led to a really calcium-rich porcelain body uh, during this period. Uh, to move on to the decorations, initially it was a struggle to create polychrome decorations at the Meissen factory. However, by the 1720s, we have this lovely color palette um, that started to emerge. And the focus of this project was really these two purple colorants that are shown here. So from initial XRF analyses, um, it was identified that gold was present within these purple uh, colorants, uh, but their optical properties are quite different. So zooming into it a little bit more carefully, we can see that within a uh, Botker luster, we have more of a deep um, brown purple with iridescence effects in the form of these little gold specks. Uh, but in purple cassias, we have a different tone of purple that is not iridescent. Uh, so uh, despite these different optical effects, uh, both of the pigments or both of the glazes contain gold. So uh, in order to better identify why the optical properties were so different, uh, we used a, a focused ion beam to cut cross section slices of uh, these samples for transmission electron microscopy. So as an overview, we can think of these uh, samples as being layered materials consisting of a substrate that's a porcelain body. On top of that, we have our Botker clear glaze. And on top of that, we have our overglaze enamel that is typically rich in lead. And that's where we believe th that the pigment was um, within. So with the focused ion beam, we cut little slices, and this is the result where we can identify the clear glaze um, below. And then on top of that, we can see the overglaze enamel. And if you look closely, or we can see it pretty obviously, we have these large spheres towards the top of the overglaze enamel in both uh, Butker luster and also in purple of Cassius. Uh, so this is what we believe to be the, the pigment that's giving the glaze its purple color. And uh, to further study the elemental composition of this cross-section sample, we use energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy to identify that the spheres that we're seeing are actually gold nanoparticles and that they're embedded within a lead silicate matrix. What's really interesting to see is the difference between uh, Butker luster and purple of Cassius. So the nanoparticle sizes are different, but also chemically speaking, we see a really high concentration of tin directly surrounding the gold nanoparticles within purple of Cassius. Uh, and we do not see any tin present in Butker luster at all. So drawing attention again to the particle sizes, here I have two micrographs uh, with the, showing the same uh, scale bar. So you can directly compare the sizes of the nanoparticles. And we see that within Butker luster, we have really a, a variation of small nanoparticles mixed with these really large ones that are hundreds of nanometers um, thick. 
So we measured the particle separation, uh, the nearest neighbor separation uh, in the two places, and they were more or less comparable. But what's really striking is the difference in the uh, radius of the particle sizes. So with purple cassius, we have much more uniform and gold nanoparticles. Uh, but with what's gray luster, we have a, a really great deviation, like I talked about. So moving on to the purple of cassius, uh, one thing that I want to bring up is that this particle size that we're observing is actually really comparable to what was used by ruby glass and cranberry glass makers at the time. So these types of materials, what they are uh, shown here, are just um, colloidal gold suspended in a tin-rich matrix. And the reason the tin is uh, commonly used uh, to form uh, gold nanoparticles is the tin can act as a reducing agent. Uh, so um, what we believe is happening is that the gold nanoparticles that are formed in purple of cassius are actually prepared um, ex situ, so before they're applied onto the object through a mixture with tin. And then this gold rich and tin rich mixture is applied onto the glazed object and infused directly on top of it. And, and this uh, might explain why we're seeing a, um, a very uniform nanoparticle distribution and also why we have such a high concentration of tin uh, directly surrounding those small and uniform nanoparticles. In contrast, uh, what we see with uh, Botker luster is very similar to what we see with other types of lusterware. So here I have some images taken from examples of copper and silver uh, lusterware. And if we look at these micrographs, which uh, I believe are also cross-sectioned uh, images taken with transmission electron microscopy of uh, lusterware samples, you can see a wide variation in nanoparticle sizes. So you can see like larger ones here, smaller, whoop, smaller ones next to it. And this is very similar to what we're seeing with Botker luster. So um, the main reason why there's this variation in nanoparticle uh, sizes actually has to do with the application method of how uh, lusterware is prepared. So typically, at least with what has been reported with copper and silver lusterware, you start off with metal salts that are directly applied onto glazed surface, surfaces. And then there's the luster forming firing step that takes place at low temperature, so typically around 600 degrees Celsius, that allows the metal salts to diffuse into the glaze and reduce into nanoparticles. And this leads to variation in nanoparticle sizes because you have different, um, um, different nucleation sites occurring throughout that firing step. So those nanoparticles that are larger were the first to nucleate and have had the greatest time to grow, while those nanoparticles that are smaller in, si in size are um, most recently formed. Uh, so you don't have a chemical agent like tin that helps uh, with the uniformity of particle sizes, and instead you have this larger distribution uh, that is common not just in uh, Butzger luster, but also in other types of lusterware. So in order to confirm that this was true, uh, we tried to recreate purple luster through a similar method of applying a gold salt onto a clay surface and then um, um, having a, a luster firing step take place. So to make our recreations, we started off by creating our porcelain substrates and the Butger clear glaze uh, using recipes based on Kingery and Vandiver. And we also tried uh, different iterations of our lead rich glaze for the over, overglaze enamel. Uh, and our variations had different quantities, different ratios of uh, lead to aluminum silica, knowing that high additions of lead can um, decrease the melting temperature of that glaze. Then when it came to uh, actually um, forming the nanoparticles, we looked at recently translated recipes from mycin to learn that in the original factory, what they used was that they reacted gold with acroregia, 
And then they could convert this into um, in, within an alkaline media into the highly explosive gold hydrazide as shown here that easily reduces into metal gold. So gold hydrazide is, was the metal uh, salt that was uh, fused with, um, with, with the flux and then applied onto uh, the glaze. And the only reason that that was fused is because it's so explosive that it can react so easily with air. Um, so that contact between the salt and air was minimized. And then during the firing step, the salt reduced into gold uh, nanoparticles at different rates, leading to that variation in particle size. So in our lab, we didn't want to work with gold hydrazide. Um, so instead, what we did was use gold chloride um, on our samples. And um, with a similar concept of these gold salts are, are then going to uh, reduce into gold nanoparticles. So these are some of our results. And as you can see, we have examples of purple luster in some of these recreations. And if we look really closely uh, with scanning electron microscopy, we can link luster to a similar surface microstructure that has gold nanoparticles of different sizes. Um, so just as an overview, our samples consisted of a porcelain body, a clear glaze, and between the interface of these two, we have uh, we can observe malite crystals uh, coming out into the glaze. And on top of the clear glaze is where we have the lead-rich overglaze enamel. And zooming into that region um, using energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, we can identify that the gold spheres that we see at the top of that overglaze enamel in our recreation are also gold. And from a surface perspective, we can also see this variation in particle size where we have larger nanoparticles and um, mixed also with smaller ones, um, which also, again, links the application method of lusterware to the, the optical properties and to the um, structure of the nanoparticle array. Um, and looking at the average nanoparticle sizes, uh, even though it is larger than what was seen with historic uh, Botker luster, it still has a very similar uh, deviation. So we can solve the question of what makes a purple colorant lustrous or not by looking at the nanoparticle arrays in Botker luster and purple of Cassius and studying how these structures interact with light to produce different optical effects. To do this, we used a model proposed by uh, Garcia de Abajo, originally used to study luster glazes made from silver and copper nanoparticles. So in this model, the gold nanoparticle layers were approximated as two-dimensional arrays of particles subjected to light uh, that is incident, that, that is normal to the surface of the glaze. Uh, so starting off with uh, comments about Butger luster, um, we see this large distribution due to the multiple nucleation sites uh, seen during firing. Uh, and the purple color of this glaze is really a result of the me scattering of the small nanoparticles that are present within this glaze. Um, it's, that's within the nanoparticle size that we would expect to see um, for, for me scattering. While these larger particles that you can observe here are actually producing uh, disordered nanoparticle array interference effects, which is causing light to diffract in such a way that uh, the glaze appears iridescent. Um, and really, this is the reason why we see luster within uh, Butger luster. Moving on to purple of Cassius, we have controlled particle growth emerging from the presence of tin in the preparation of this glaze. And as a result, we only have small nanoparticles that uh, contribute to the me scattering that gives the glaze its purple color um, and a different tone also. Um, and because we have this absence of the larger nanoparticle sizes, we don't see any array interference effects. And for that reason, purple cassius is not lustrous, um, unlike Botker luster. So um, we can also use the nanoparticle size and nearest neighbor separation data to model the color of historic Botker luster and Kubelka, uh, using Kubelka-Monk theory. 
a theory that is commonly used in our conservation science and colorimetry to model the appearance of opaque paint layers by relating the optical properties of the layer back to the concentration of the original pigments, which in this case is the concentration of the gold nanoparticles. Our particle distribution data can be used to calculate the scattering and absorption coefficients shown here. And our particle distribution data can, um, can then be used to, to find that at each specific wavelength. Um, so then these coefficients can be used in Kabelka monk theory to estimate the reflectivity of the layer at each wavelength, allowing us to compute a theoretical UV bis spectrum of historic Botka luster and model the color of the glaze for a series of indices of refraction ranging from one to four. And the UV bis spectra obtained using Kovalka monk theory uh, could also be compared to an experimentally measured UV bis spectrum of historic Botker luster. Um, both spectra describe that the colorant reflects mostly red light with small amounts of blue light, which together form the expected dark purple tones of Botker luster. And we also compare this uh, to the UV bis spectrum of our luster recreation and found that it also reflects red light with slightly less blue light, which together forms a, a slightly pinker color than the historic sample. And just to mention the sharp reflectivity that we see at 500 nanometers is due to the high concentration of lead in our vibration, uh, which is higher than what was seen with the historic sample. Um, so in conclusion, Botker luster belongs to the family of lusterware, a type of metallic decoration that has been employed by artisans since 9th century common era Mesopotamia. Shown here is an example of red luster produced by copper nanoparticles from 17th century Iran. In Botker luster, purple luster is achieved by the presence of gold nanoparticles shown as decorations on this teapot. It can be distinguished from other gold-based purple color and or purple overglaze enamels, such as purple of cassius, by its lack of tin and also, most importantly, its method of preparation. The use of Botgar luster was very brief, commencing at around 1710 or 1719 and wrapping up after 1735. It has not persisted since then, and as such, the documentation of how this overglaze enamel was produced and used is limited to the 18th century. There was no detailed scientific understanding of how this glaze was created, and its unique purple luster remained a mystery for centuries. But advancements in microscopic and spectroscopic techniques have permitted us to revisit this mystery and investigate the overglaze enamels on the nanoscale, providing us with the key information needed to recreate purple luster and additionally, the models applied in the study helped us interpret how the nanoparticle layers within the overglaze enamels ultimately controlled the optical behaviors of the glazes. Uh, Me scattering of particles with radii between 15 and 250 nanometers gave rise to the purple tones of the glazes, while disordered particle array interference of the larger particles uh, is the main cause for the iridescence seen in purple luster providing new insights into the differences observed between these two contemporaneous purple glazes from Mycin. So with all of that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and please let me know if you have any questions. And I'd also like to encourage you if you're interested in learning more about this project to check out our paper that was published earlier this year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheila, that was great. Lovely figures. Really, really well done. Okay, um, now that everyone's had a chance to listen to of our colorful presentations, um, do you have questions to ask to well, for our speakers? We'll have a little bit of time now before we proceed with the uh, uh, heritage science professional of the day to have a discussion about what you've just heard. So. Uh, please do raise your hands or write the questions in the chat. Well, uh, Trevor, 
Hi. Thank, yeah, thank, uh, two very interesting talks. Um, very impressive illustrations as well. I have a, 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 set, a question for Sarah um, concerning your um, copper carbonates. As I, I'm a geologist and I've grappled with impure copper carbonates from a geological viewpoint. They're very, very, you very rarely get them pure in, in nature. I was wondering, your, your experiments, did, ha, have you been able to compare them with or possibly construct a sort of phase diagram or an EHPH diagram to, to show the relative stabilities? Um, so we start, I've done very early kind of phase diagrams just with like, well, a kind of 3D phase space, but of temperature concentration of the stirring to begin with, just to try and yeah. work out in what when you travel in one direction in temperature, for example, um, what products favoured. Um, and with pH, that's one of the main directions of research that Ellen's going down. Um, she's done quite a lot of work already um, looking at the pH of the solution, how that affects what products made, because that is really important. For example, differentiating between um, azurite and malachite, um, like all of the like geology work on that, um, it's pH that um, determines which of those form. Um, and so we're trying to kind of look at the geology literature for how these minerals form and see if we can relate those to what's happening in these reactions, although the conditions are so different, um, it's often quite yeah. hard to do. Um, but yeah, so there are Paul Bay diagrams um, explaining the relative yeah. stabilities of azurite and malachite, it's then managing to apply them to our system. But yeah, it's a yeah, but you, if I can, If I'm allowed a supplementary, um, looking at the morphologies, especially in your SEM images, um, the only mineral that seems to show you hedral form or well formed film is the rhuaites. Everything else seems to be sort of fluffy or granular or whatever, which would seem to me to imply some sort of metastable growth. Would, would, would you agree with that interpretation? Um, yeah, I hadn't thought of the morphology relating to being metastable. That hasn't wasn't something we talked about. We talked a lot about the stabilities and about whether the like why you're going from rhuaites to whether rhuaites is metastable or whether it's um, like it to be like what kind of the thermodynamics and kinetics of relating the two um, and whether it's irreversible and reversible. Um, I mean, you like Ellen's done a lot more work on the morphology of um, synthetic azurite, so she would probably be better to answer about that, like the morphology itself. But um, it does like I don't know whether it was that clear from those images, but it does have. Um, like a more regular morphology. It also has a regular morphology, but because of the um, scale differences in those images, you could see the rewrite particles a lot more clearly. But if you zoomed in on the synthetic as you write it, it does look. But I think but, that's uh, an interesting uh, circuit. Uh, size is important, isn't it? Because you have the surface area and, the, and these things are reacting and growing whatever, basically at their surfaces, aren't they? So, mm -hmm. so I don't think you can entirely dismiss the, uh, the growing mm -hmm. size. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, good luck. I, I mean, I know from bitter experience grappling with these. I was, I was going to swear the copper carbonates and hydroxides and everything. It's a very tricky problem. So good luck with that. And uh, you've made a good start. Yeah, thank you. OK, so for now, if anyone's thinking of a question meanwhile i'll ask celia um does the thickness of the application of the luster have an effect on uh, on its properties and um have perhaps you've examined that or uh, or read maybe that's part of part of the whole package yeah so um when it came to our experiments, we used the same thickness throughout, but actually something that uh, we saw with our experimental model is um, we, we looked at an infinitely thick layer. So it wasn't like a th set thickness and we could still identify uh, the disordered nanoparticle array interference, interference occurring on a surface uh, level. So based on that study, it doesn't seem like the thickness of the luster uh, layer is actually going to um, affect whether there's luster or not. It's just the fact that you have a disordered nanoparticle array at the very surface of the, the overglaze enamel that causes it. 
And yeah, that's based on the model. Okay. No, I thought perhaps maybe you know, the, the, the amount of particles physically that the light has to go through would have some sort of an effect. Um, there's a lot of parallels with, with glass coloration and uh, the use of nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles in glass you know, and Roman, some Roman examples are fascinating. Okay. <laughs> Please do feel free ask, to ask any questions. And this is uh, this is a seminar meant to have a you know, to discuss troubleshoot and um, maybe get new ideas. So we've got, um, there you go. We've got a got a question in the chats uh, from Ali. Uh, thank you, thank you too for the great presentations. I have a question for Celia. Why do you think the technique was used for such a short time and stopped after only a few decades? You're muted, Celia. Sorry. Yes, sorry. Right. Uh, my guess would be the um, for safety reasons. Um, so what was being used, gold hydrazide, uh, was really dangerous to handle. And even from the translated recipes that you can still find that were originally from Mycin, there are a lot of comments about how um, explosive the material was. And there's even a quote, I, I don't think I'm saying it uh, word by word, but it was something along the lines of, the bigger the explosion, the more beautiful the color. So there's uh, I would imagine that that's part of the reason why it was um, used for a short period of time. Um, yeah, if I had to guess. That's a, yeah, deadly art. How did they? How did they stop that from happening? Very sealed yeah. containers. Um, so one of the tricks that I remember reading was that they mixed it straight away with a, a free uh, to just try to minimize any uh, contact with air between these gold salts. Um, and then this is what they applied directly on before the firing step. Uh, so I don't, I don't know what other kind of safety procedures <laughs> they carried out, but my guess is not as definitely not comparable to modern day standards. Okay. Uh, oh, in the chat, yes, as uh, my uh, co-chair for today, Caroline, um, has said that if the speakers would also like to ask anyone in the audience um, any questions about the ideas of challenges, uh, that anyone else has encountered. Um, so it's I mean, two-way like, conversation. This work, as you can see, is very much ongoing. Um, I think Celia's managed to get some more of the answers, but um, it's still very much in the middle. So, um, I mean, if anyone's an expert in early modern um, scientific techniques and happens to know about whether they could make carbon dioxide atmospheres at that period, um, that would be super helpful. Otherwise, have to carry on researching that. But also we kind of like in this we're coming across how much there's lot so many identifications of um oh trevor has an answer to that <laughs> yeah I, 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 um, I, i've recently completed a study with um uh, camille polkovnik i don't know if you've heard of her she was at the time she was at the hamilton car institute in uh, in cambridge and we grappled with this manufacturer of lead white was uh, was um, camille's chosen chosen poison which is an appropriate name of course so uh, yeah, I, I mean i think the um, i think one of the things you discover um in these processes and i've had similar experiences myself with egyptian blue 
is that you could, you've got recipes, and we know we, now we can work out stoichiometries, you know, fairly easily when you're with electron probes and such ever. But and you can use the same reagents over and over again in the same furnace in the same crucibles, and twenty percent of them just don't work. And try and, and I think what you learn from that is that the is the frustrations of the original craftsmen that were making this stuff, and also a lot of sort of unwritten. Um, knowledge, verbal knowledge um, that that just doesn't get passed on. You know, people keep that. I don't know whether they keep, deliberately keep it secret, but I think there's a. Uh, you know, I, I've I've worked in working lab making Egyptian blue, and I've had this blue powder all over the place, and and trying to get the stuff out the crucible and all that. And you can just imagine, you know, being on the on the banks of the Nile four thousand years ago, and the guys having exactly the same frustrations. You know. And, and that they they didn't have the luxury of temperature controlled electronic furnaces either. So, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think you 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 have to accept that there is a degree of learning in all these processes. We might think we're very clever with phase chemistry and electron microscopes, but there's a lot. If we're going to make these things the way that the the old guys did it, then um, we, we've got a lot to learn. All of us have got a lot to learn. Yeah, certainly we should find that. <laughs> um, and I mean, actually, even cases where um, some of the authors seem to have written that it should be made at higher temperatures, but that is now thought to be kind of um, protect like patenting. So to make sure that other people weren't copying the ideas to deliberately put the opposite of what should have been done. Um, so well, trying to well, work through I, I, lots I, of that I, is I, quite... <laughs> I think that's right, and I, I know I, I get into debates about um, the, the meaning of, of, of recipes by Vitruvius for the Egyptian blue. As written, his recipe doesn't work, you know, because there's no, no calcium in it. And then the people find, well, there's, there's shells in the sand and all that sort of stuff. But, but who knows? Maybe they are deliberately, uh, and many years ago, working through trying to recreate uh, medieval coloured glass. And I think somebody mentioned the red glass, the red evil med glass, which is nanoparticles of gold of course and trying to make that that was a nightmare i moved on you know but i moved on to copper carbonates and wish i hadn't you know because they're, they're complicated as well um but yeah i, I think uh, all i would say is, is that you you just have to accept there's a lot of un indeterminate features and you just have to learn those by practice and experience yeah great thank you Sarah, I had a question for you, actually. Uh, you talked about the microstructures of pure ruide, um, and I don't recall you talking about what the microstructure of um, pure azurite looks like. Does it actually look like those interlocking flakes? Or um, Yeah, so Ellen, my supervisor's overall work, very much focuses on um, the like if you just have examples of blue to being able to distinguish it from natural as you write um and her samples that she found have the same um like structure as what we were seeing um in those samples that we made um so yeah it does seem to be the same um but yeah that will link nicely in another presentation link nicely into um, the work she's doing but yeah so it does match i see and do you know what the microstructure of the malachite that you're seeing looks like um, yes, um, I think Ellen has, she might, Ellen, if you can write what the answer is for, um, what the description is, because I can't quite remember, but, um, again, it has been characterized properly, so. Okay, yeah, yeah, because I, I know that the particle size of malachite can actually really, um, uh, affect the color at the end, um, so that could be something, if, if you can identify the malachite particles, it could give you information on whether they're, the color is more deep blue or whether it's lighter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, particle size, because obviously, yeah, the optical pro properties are very dependent on particle size. Um, and so, that, so the growth of the particles could also be a reason that the color is deep. So as your right particles even could be affecting the color. So that's, yeah, thank you. Something else that needs more research into. message from Ellen Purdy. Right. <laughs> Synthetic green. Uh, Redditor appears similarly small and interlocking. Uh, natural samples of both malachite and azurite are significantly different. It's to the previous. Perhaps all of this research data that you've generated, Sarah, could be also very useful for 
identifying fakes, uh, perhaps uh, uh, faked artifacts. Yeah, so yeah. this is the other thing. Hopefully, um, some of this will be then useful in conservation um, situations, trying to work out what the pigment is. Um, and yeah, as you say, like it could be if rewrite is a distinguishing factor, lots more research needs to be done into that because it could be that rewrite um, degrades on the time scale of from the mid 17th century to now. So it might not be present anyway. There's lots of things like that that need research into. But yeah, if it if people started looking at blue birds to samples and found rewrite, that would be really interesting. Yeah, fantastic. We've we've got about uh, five minutes or so until we continue with our next speaker. So, do you feel free to ask uh, last few questions? Or, if if you, Celia or Sarah, have uh, any questions, any more questions to the audience? Mm -hmm. Celia, is there any further research directions that you'd be interested in going in from what you've already done, like any outstanding questions or applications? I think there's always a way to extend these projects. Um, so something that could be interesting is um, trying out different conditions of how the luster firing step occurs, um, because I think uh, we mentioned it before, um, there, there's a lot of recipes that don't have as much detailed information as we wish they would. <laughs> so a, a lot of these recreations occur through trial and error. And uh, being able to link more precisely firing temperature conditions like ramp rates, holding times, um, target temperatures and linking that to particle distributions, I think would be really informative. Um, because right now we have one, like one data point from that perspective where we, we tried uh, a series of different glazes, that was our variable, but we um, performed the same um, firing step in all three cases. So now taking this one step further and trying to use the same composition, but varying the firing temperatures and the holding times might be an interesting uh, way to continue this project to see how that in turn can affect the nanoparticle array and, and then the optical properties of the glaze. And in that way also to get more information about the techniques that were used in mycin originally to see how it compares to the historic samples. Yeah. But yeah, there's been a lot of work on luster, luster wear that um, comes from silver and copper nanoparticles. So this was really interesting to have a new example that was now gold nanoparticles and uh, it kind of complemented the current work out there and uh, the other types. So there's a lot more research to do for gold 